So Bitcoin is, is historically highly correlated with various liquidity indicators, right? So basically how much capital is kind of available liquid for investment. Uh, you know, a lot of other investments, they trade off things like earnings, they trade off uh, all sorts of other things, whereas Bitcoin is actually one of the purest liquidity correlations that are out there. Um, and ever since autumn of last year, liquidity improve, uh, uh, conditions have actually been, in, in many cases, moving up or sideways a little bit. Basically, they declined all throughout 2022. When it got to the end of the year, the dollar index came off of its highs. Uh, you started to get Chinese reopening. You started to get uh, you know, the, the, the market pricing and slower forward Fed hiking. Inflation was off of its highs. Uh, you had a drawdown in the Treasury Journal account. Uh, you know, that's it's kind of jargon for some, but basically, there's a bunch of things that improve liquidity. And I actually think that you know, Bitcoin probably would have bounced in quarter four if not for the whole FTX, uh, you know, implosion, uh, because you started to see a, a bounce in a number of risk assets. Uh, we saw uh, good movements in precious metals, including, you know, ones like silver, you know, that are that are historically more cyclical. And so I think that basically this is kind of a, a pent up uh, move. Uh, from those overall uh, better liquidity conditions. I think the, con the the somewhat concerning thing is that you're also seeing a bounce in like meme stocks uh, mm -hmm. and unprofitable stocks this year. Uh, and so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see some of this be, be given back or some of this, you know, consolidate for a period of time. But essentially, I, th I think that, you know, liquidity, at least locally, reached its, its worst point last year and at least is, is kind of a, a mild, uh, you know, improvement. So I think that's going to partially depend on how adamant the Fed is uh, in trying to tighten in the face of decelerating data. I, I think in most market conditions, this would probably be like a you know a, a, a top in the dollar, and we'd see more easing conditions from here. Like historically, for example, when you see the two-year Treasury uh, roll below the Fed funds rate, usually the Fed is done hiking. Um, and so you know these, these in normal market environments, these would probably start to signal a top. Now, because inflation is still historically high, because uh, Jerome Powell has tied his reputation to getting inflation back down, right. uh, they could they could be a little bit stickier than they have been in prior cycles. So I, I, it's possible that we're we'll retest this. It's possible that we're we'll experience more turbulence. Um, but I think this is at least the beginning of a of a rotation in liquidity, even if it's maybe not the the final move. I think with the data we have at hand now, that's most likely. Uh, we recently saw, for example, industrial production came out pretty weak. We saw retail sales come out pretty weak. There's kind of broad-based deceleration. Uh, the New York Fed recession model uh, is flashing recession. Um, and so I, I think 25 basis points is probably the most likely scenario. Um, the, you know, data between now and then could 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 tweak those odds somewhat. Essentially, what we're seeing is that even though there's they're, they're intending to continue tightening, they're in, intending to hold their tightness for longer. Uh, we are clearly seeing a deceleration of expectations around how much they're going to tighten, in, in large part because we've seen a deceleration in inflation and a deceleration in economic activity. So I, I think 25 basis points is most likely. I, I think around the margins, yes, because for example, if you look at the Fed's mandates, you know they're not mandated to maximize industrial production, uh, but they are mandated to to maximize long-term uh, employment, right? And so they they look at basically employment and inflation as their two primary things to, to optimize for. Uh, by extension, they also have to optimize for uh, financial stability. So for example, if the treasury market goes liquid, if the junk bond market, you know, if that goes completely liquid and, and stops trading, they, they pretty much have to step in because that's going to start eventually cascading into, into failures of financial institutions and, and employment. But really at the, at the, you know, when it comes down to it, those two initial mandates are what they optimize for. And so, Empl the, the challenge, of course, is that employment is a lagging indicator, right? So usually you don't get uh, substantial increases in unemployment until you're already in a recession. It's basically coincident or lagging compared to other things. Now, we can isolate certain um, aspects of employment that are a little bit more leading. So, for example, if you look at temporary help, um, uh, if you if you imagine running a business and you're facing challenges, you're more likely to, to let go of temporary help services before you'd let go your your you know your permanent employees uh, that have more experience at your company. And and generally, so you see a lot more volatility and a lot of uh, kind of a leading indicator from temporary help, both on the upside and the downside. And that's already negative year over year. The the total people right. that are uh, officially employed in that in that um, type of work, and so even if, even in this labor market, which is pretty strong, uh, we still see early cracks. Same thing for overtime hours. That's like another leading indicator. It's looking pretty soft, uh, and so. But as long as they're looking at broad based employment, I do think that they can use that to justify staying tight uh, for a little bit longer than 
you know, you otherwise would if you're looking at leading indicators. I think where I would differ from consensus is that I doubt we're going to stay there. Um, I, I would expect future waves of inflation this decade. If you look at mm -hmm. if you look at past inflationary periods like the 1970s or the 1940s, uh, they often came in waves, uh, and that's because you know po policymakers and central banks don't just sit there and let it happen. Uh, central banks try to push back on it. They try to tighten conditions, or sometimes you have policymakers doing things like price and wage controls. That that was a historical uh, move that would happen, and so. You know, between different types of levers that different types of policymakers can can pull, they usually get a handle on inflation for brief periods of time before it it it, it runs away from them again. And so right now, as they as they try to curtail demand, um, as they you know basically suppress marginal demand, that helps bring inflation down. We also don't see. I mean, money supply was growing very quickly in 2020 and 2021. Basically, it was the fastest pace of, of broad money supply growth since World War II. Uh, but over the past 12 months, you're you're flat to negative in terms of broad money supply. Right. Uh, and so I would expect to see continued disinflationary pressures until there's a policy shift, you know, in response to recession, in response to economic softness. And then probably from there, we would have another uh, wave of inflation because some of the, the underlying, uh, you know, shortages in energy supply, for example, are unresolved, even though they can be temporarily suppressed. Well, so Europe, obviously, the, the big warning sign there is the, the uh, energy shortages, right? That that shows how how problematic things can be if you don't have your energy managed properly. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenge with natural gas is it's a far more local market than oil uh, and coal and and other types of commodities because it's very costly to transport relative to its its value, right? There, there's you need very specialized equipment. Uh, there's only so much. There's finite capacity for shipping natural gas, um, and so they they've run into the shortages. And I don't think you know right now they're off those highs, um, but I think that until they actually have a more structural investment, those could be recurring issues that you see next winter and maybe the winter after that. Um, yeah. On Japan's side, it's a very different situation. Obviously, they have similar shortages, but not as extreme. Uh, and instead, they're they're more like uh, they're the highest debt nation in the world, and right. so. What they're doing is actually rippling out because, for example, Japan, you know, even though they're very high debt, they're also positive net international investment position, which means that they own more foreign assets than foreigners own of Japanese assets. They, you know, that's from decades of running positive current account surpluses, uh, which they then reinvest in the rest of the world. And so one problem is that when they, you know, when they do start to, to tighten a little bit, uh, like we like we saw with the recent move from 25 basis points to 50 basis points on their on their 10 year some of that capital goes back to Japan. In addition, uh, you know, official policymakers can sell some of their official reserves, which they have well over a trillion dollars worth, mm -hmm. um, to prop up their currency, even if they have an artificially low interest rate. And so that withdrawal of foreign capital back into Japan can ripple through, uh, uh, you know, the world because they're the largest, yeah. uh, you know, country by net international invest position. So I think both of those are both warning signs and instructive, and they also then have rippling effects throughout the rest of the world. I mean, Germany is a, a major manufacturer, Japan right. is a major financier, and these are all interconnected.